Good morning, good evening in Melbourne. It's just uh, about five minutes past 10 p.m., seven o'clock past eight o'clock in uh, on the Eastern Standard Time because I didn't even ask which part of uh, the States you are because I know you're on the Eastern Standard Time, but it's uh, one of those very exciting moments for me to meet the person who played a major role on our lives, on our kids' lives, uh, uh, decision to undergo a bone marrow transplant. So for people who have seen the ad for the past week, I've got Belinda Clark. She shared a story a few years back of a son who lived with sickle cell disease like her son and my daughter. They've had the bone marrow, bone marrow transplant to cure sickle cell disease, the only reliable cure at the moment. Okay. I know there's gene therapy and gene editing, but for bone marrow transplant, we are sure that we are the lucky few whose kids have been um, cured for sickle cell disease. So... Welcome, Belinda. Lovely to meet Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I am truly humbled to be here. The reason why I did share my story is um, I really wanted to support and help in any way form for anybody who was going through this type of crisis in their life. Because um, truly, it, it, it is an interesting and tough experience to go through. So I'm happy to be here and I'm so happy to meet you. Oh, thank you so much. You didn't know what you are doing miles and miles away across the <laughs> world. When we were told that uh, our daughter potentially will get this treatment, the only thing that I know best in my life that I've got control over is to read and read and read. And I found your video and we were like studying every time to, to look at your son, to look at your story and everything that we should do. And uh, that happened about two years ago for us. So my daughter is shy. She doesn't even want to hear about anything social media. She can't even come and meet you, but I'm here. So our story today, we said we are going to share your experience uh, having this life-changing experience in your family for your son to undergo a bone marrow transplant. But before we do that, I just want to ask you, I, I deliberately, I didn't put like a long biography. I wanted people to concentrate on your face and see the topic. Tell us about yourself briefly. Who's Belinda Clark? Because I didn't do that. I didn't put anything about you. Thank you. Um, I am a nurse. And um, one of the things that in, the greatest influence actually on my life to become a nurse was the fact that my first son was born with sickle cell disease. I wasn't sure, there were a lot of decisions that I had to make and I wasn't sure how to make these decisions, what would be the best decisions to make for him. And that's what influenced me to become a nurse. So I've been a nurse for about um, nine, around nine to 10 years now. And um, I love taking care of people. Um, the only thing is I don't really work with um, a lot of kids because it still does affect me what I went through with my son. So um, I do work with the elderly. We live right now in Fairfax, Virginia, and um, I have four sons. So <laughs> Mom. <laughs> Malik. Yeah. Malik is the eldest and um, he was the recipient of the bone marrow transplant. My second is Michael. And he is the donor of the bone marrow transplant that saved his brother's life. There's also Miles and my youngest is Mahir. So Malik is now 16. Michael is now 14. He's going to be 15 this month. Um, I have a 10-year-old Miles and a four-year-old Mahir. I, I hear, I mean, this is off the topic. Why the M's? <laughs> Was it that? <laughs> I started with the M's and so I continued, but I will tell you, it is the most confusing thing. I call them the wrong name all the time. <laughs> it's just, um, at some point it's just you or child one or two, because I keep yeah. mixing up the names all the time. I hear you. I hear you. Like you, I have four children too, and I, I am a nurse as well, but I didn't start off as a nurse. I, I changed careers when our daughter was um, 
you know, found with this condition and I was just confused. So I went into nursing and like you, I work in the HK as well. So there we are, <laughs> very <Awesome>. similar. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yes. so and with the names, oh my God, I, yeah, I confuse <laughs> them all the time. So well, lovely, to, lovely to know a bit about you. And um, so, you know, what I like just finding out, because it's, it's really interesting to see that I've, I've spoken to over maybe 60, 70 people so far. We've got something in common. Most of the people that I've spoken to, they all didn't have anything to know about sickle cell disease, especially us from an African background. I know in America, there's the newborn screening that, that started in the 1980s. You know, so you sort of talk more about sickle cell disease than we do. And maybe even your, your healthcare, I mean, your education system is something that you talk about. We don't at all. I can't remember at school being taught, but we knew one or two friends had sickle cell disease. So before all this, like before you even decided to have a family, did you know anything about sickle cell disease, about your sickle cell status? Well, I was fortunate um, because when I was younger, I was actually sourced to give blood. And so I did find out, they do screen you. So I did find out, and this was around when I actually was in high school. So I was aware that I did have um, the trait, sickle cell trait. And I kind of did a bit of research and, and found out. And so ultimately in my head, it was make sure you don't, um, date or marry someone who has sickle cell trait also. So I was pretty aware, but my partner, um, he was not aware about sickle cell, had never really talked about it or anything like that. So I guess in some respects, I just assumed that he really didn't really know anything about it. But for the newborn screening in America, that is one of the diseases that they check for. And I, think, I guess it's not something that we, we, we talk about because I remember when I was dating with my husband now then, you know, one, one of the things that we we busy talking about was like HIV, like, and it's there, it's in the news and everything, but it's not something that comes up when you are engrossed in all this love, you know, you know, it's not something like, you know, have you got tested and all that. It's not something that you, you you can ever actually even think about to know like oh by the way do you know your sickle cell status I you know I it don't think it's something was, yeah. it wasn't something that we talked about at all I do believe that I did mention sickle cell trait at some point but it wasn't um, any kind of a long conversation that we had um, so like I said I just kind of assumed that he never even heard about sickle cell or you know, anyone in his family ever had anything to do with sickle cell disease. And so, you know, we went on from there. When Malik was actually born, they called me to the hospital and they basically said, um, you need to sit down. Now, the minute you hear those words, yeah. there's oh, a that is not good news. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so I did you know, I sat down and I said, okay, just, you know, whatever it is, just, I don't need a long spiel, just tell me the truth. And the nurse said, um, your son has sickle cell. So I said, yeah, sure, of course, um, I have the trait. So he probably has the trait too. And um, she said, no, he has sickle cell disease. So then right away, I knew and understood that his father had the trait. And obviously, you know, it was just completely devastating that, that news for me at that point. But did you know the severity though? I mean, um, for me, I sort of had an idea that my friend had it. And when we came to, we migrated to Australia, I had friends in the community whose kids have it. But, you know, we it's not something that I sat down to read and to know the severity of uh, sickle cell disease. And at that point, did you think like, you know, this is what are we what we are going to expect after this? No. Um, when I went home, I same thing like what you did. I went on the internet. I started reading. I started researching. What exactly is this all about? How is he going to feel? How is this going to affect him? And the more I read, I just started crying. The more I read, I just I just became so tearful, and it just felt like 
the worst prognosis ever that, you know, when I read about the crisis, the pain he would be going through, it just, I kind of just froze and just, I, I really, it sent me into depression, really. Yes, and uh, I don't know about you, but you know, those, the what ifs come in, like maybe I should have known better or, uh, and then the, I guess the question is, would you have done anything differently? I don't know. For me, I've never found that answer, to be honest. Um, I, I definitely have never found that answer either. And the journey that our life has taken is so amazing. And there's so much that we have learned as a family because of sickle cell disease that I really don't think that, um, you know, it's, it's shaped so much of who we are now. I, I, I myself can't really find the answer to that question. The way things happened to, I am a very spiritual person and I, you know, I do believe in God and um, I do believe that there's a great purpose here. And um, I am so thankful. I am so grateful. I feel like I've had my personal miracle in life. Same, same, same. Uh, I, I guess I've, I'm just like trying to mirror you as well. I'm looking at myself because even as like, I'm very, very spiritual. That's what people don't know about me. Most of my friends know that. Even our, our decision to, to actually go through with the bone marrow transplant was based on the fact that, you know, we just put it to him. For years, we kept it off for obvious reasons and other reasons, but there was just a time when we felt it was right. And before we did everything, we just had to ask for prayers from our friends, ourselves, and, you know, our hospital bed, our hospital room was a, a war room, if you can call it that way, in terms of prayer. And uh, so I can relate to that. So now you are told that your child has sickle cell disease and then the anxiety comes in because you know how different it is for me. We were those typical presentation to ED because we didn't know our sickle cell status. We didn't know that our child had sickle cell disease. You knew on the other hand. So when did you, when did she, when you present um, with the, the, you know, the symptoms or any crisis at all? Okay, so the first time he presented with a crisis, he was a little over a year old. And um, I had been sort of forewarned um, because he was in a clinic that he would no longer have the protection of his um, newborn hemoglobin because that usually protects them for the first year from crises. Um, so it was a little, him being a little over a year, the first time he did have a crisis, and um, it was just, you know, he, he was in a bit of pain. It wasn't anything major. We did go to the hospital. And um, so I kind of, you know, I wasn't very alarmed at that point. So, you know, while he was young, I also, I didn't work. I didn't want to let him out of my sight. It really is quite a life-changing thing for you. Um, to put it bluntly, from everything that I researched and knew, I basically thought that I was just going to have him for a short period of time. And so I really just wanted to, you know, try to make the best of that and try to give him the best quality of life that I possibly could. Yeah. And I think your son was born just around the time when uh, Facebook was coming on. And you read all these stories, horrific stories on Facebook that were just so depressing. And all you do as a parent is cry and get <laughs> depressed because you see yourself, your family, that that's my, my child in the few years to come. And the anxiety of not knowing when a crisis was going to come, like you're literally walking around with a bag, with a thermometer, with Panadol. I don't know whether you call it Telenor, that side, you call it Paracetamol, Panadol. And you're just crazy. Like I went for a holiday. Every time we are in the car, like where's the medicine bag? Because we need to check the, the temperature, the, the oxygen and all that. Um, so in terms of treatment, what made you decide from the time he was born, he had the first sickle cell crisis to the treatment options? So what was he put on to start managing the sickle cell disease? 
Right. So he was followed by a team of nurses and doctors in a clinic here. So anytime we did have a crisis, we always had at least two to three bags packed also at home, ready to go. Um, 911 on speed dial, um, because you know how crises are. It could be simply a change in weather. Like right now, we're in a fall season. And as it starts to get cold, it could just be maybe the door was open and some cold air came in and you know, it's time to go. Um, so we, he was being followed by a team of doctors and nurses. So anytime we arrived at the hospital, we were taken in right away. We didn't, we never had to wait in the emergency room. So that's one of the protocols that they have in um, America. We were, he, they sent him right through straight to his room and they would just try to hook him up to pain medication, get him checked out immediately. Um, so that, that, that was really um, awesome on this end. And so what I did is I started to just do research. I said, you know what? I'm not just going to give up. I'm not going to give up. I started the research. I said, I don't care if it's somebody doing uh, research or have um, something going on about sickle cell in Timbuktu. I don't care where it is. I'm going to find this cure. I'm going to find a person who's as passionate as I am about, you know, helping sickle cell patients. And so I started to do research. I joined different forums um, and just always told the doctors, you know, if you guys hear of anything happening, just let me know um, any, you know, any product, new protocols, anything. Just let me know I'm willing to try for him because he did have um, maybe about, at least about four or five experiences where we were in the ICU. Um, there was a point at which his um, digestive enzymes just backed up, his liver enzymes, everything backed up. He was in the ICU. His eyes basically were like neon green. It was just so many things happening to him and the pain, the pain, the pain. I just, he would just scream and I, I, it was really, really tough. And so I said, I don't care what I have to do. There must be, you know, we just kept praying and praying. And um, I knew there, there, there somebody somewhere, you know, would be doing some type of research. And um, fortunately, um, there was a team of doctors in New York and they were actually doing bone marrow transplants, but they were only doing it for um, sibling donors. It was strictly sibling donors. Um, I think they had had um, another donor with another patient and it didn't work out. So they had a hundred percent success with sibling donors. And at that point, his little brother was around. Um, he was just... Uh, I think he was maybe about three years old at that point. So then again, to consider putting him through what he had to go through because he had to get epigen injections to be making more bone marrow. We had actually saved Malik's cord blood um, and Michael's cord blood, but it wasn't enough. Oh. So they would actually <laughs> have to... That was a good thing to do because I remember our daughter who ended up being a donor. We were asked, but that my, my pregnancy wasn't that great, so I can't even remember. I think vividly, maybe they did ask us just when I was giving birth whether they could save it, and I think we said no or yes. I've always wanted to go back to ask whether they did actually save it. So uh, that's interesting that we actually did that. So you saved it, and was that the the one you used for? For the transplant? So they, they use that for all of their initial testing. And um, since uh, Michael, they did ask for permission since he was so young to actually harvest. Um, it came up that they wanted to actually harvest the bone marrow from him. Oh, that was terrifying again, of course, because basically it was like surgery. They would have to put him to sleep. He had to get um, injections for him to start making more bone marrow, um, more vitamins. So that in itself also was another major decision. But the day that they did the testing, the day that we got the results that he actually was a perfect match for Malik was one of the most breathtaking, you know, yeah. 
moment of my life. I just, mm-hmm. at that moment, I don't remember where I was, but I know I was on my knees. I was just so grateful, thankful. I, I just, it, it was incredible. It really was. Because I knew what that meant if we were successful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how did they have this? Did they have to, as Zali, as he was to drill in the pelvis or did they use the nav first machine? So they actually did have to um, drill in the pelvis and I actually was not able to witness Malik actually receiving the transplant because after um, they harvested the bone marrow from Michael, I was still with him. He hadn't woken up as yet. They basically took it fresh straight to Malik and Um, So I wasn't able to witness, I saw pictures and videos, I wasn't able to witness him receiving the actual marrow, but I was with Michael um, waiting for him to wake up after the... um, the, the Were they, are they the same blood type too? Did they have to do anything to prepare the marrow? No, they were the same blood type. And because I kept both, um, I, I did hold Malik back from starting school. Um, for one year. And so I kept him home. And one of the great things that the doctors told me is just because of the care that they received, there are a few viruses that can affect um, rejection of the transplant. Mm -hmm. But because they were taken such good care of, we didn't have any of those issues. They, They didn't encounter any of those viruses. So they really didn't want to put any type of preservatives or anything. They just wanted it fresh to go straight to Malik. And it was incredible. Wow. Yes, my, my daughter, too, the, both, both girls are the same blood type. But because of the age and everything, they did have one virus. So they had the CMV. Well, I, don't, I don't know which one. But anyway, she ended up having the CMV. It wasn't that severe. It was taken care of. But I guess because of the same blood type and being a 100% match as well. So that really helped. So that, that was a journey. And uh, unfortunately, I mean, you saw the video, but, you know, you are not there. Because, yes, you do have two kids. Our kids were one, one, one was on the top, one was on the bottom. She spent a night, the other one in the hospital. And then the other one is having a transplant. But she was real there to the, to the world, actually. And she witnessed every one of us was just wow. crazy and worshipping. <laughs> and we're all wearing, we look like angels. We're wearing gowns, white gowns because of the protection. And we're just praising the whole 90 minutes, just praying. Like, you can't just believe. And unless you are literally there. You just, you know, it's life-changing. What I, what I wanted to do before we go into detail, just to ask about your experience, I actually found the video again. I'll show <laughs> you. I found the video. Let me see. Where is it? Uh, so let me see if I can share a screen for people okay. to see this video that changed our lives, literally changing our lives. <laughs> uh, so I'll share sound and share. So the eldest and there then you Michael, are. Miles and I have a 10 month old Mahir. Sickle cell is a disease that affects red blood cells. When you have sickle cell disease, almost 50% or even more of those red blood cells actually take on a sickle shape, which is sort of like the shape of a half moon. And so they're no longer effective at carrying as much oxygen as we need throughout our bodies. Another one of the problems is that they actually get bunched up in our blood vessels at your, at your joints and it causes excruciating pain. When he was born, I actually didn't really notice anything was off with Malik. The nurse basically said that he has sickle cell. So I said, yeah, I have sickle cell trait, so he probably has the trait too. She said, no, he has the disease. They just spoke about how much pain he would be in and just a whole bunch of things that would be happening to him. I I didn't even know what to do. Like, I really lost hope. They said to us, you guys have a program where they're actually doing bone marrow transplants, but it has to be a sibling donor. He only had one sibling, and I knew it would be a really rough road for Michael. He was still young. 
course, first we had to do some tests with Michael. And um, long story short, he actually turned out to be a perfect match. We had to do a whole bunch of lab tests on Michael to make sure that um, we'd actually be able to go on with the transplant. So that's the video. <laughs> Incredible, incredible. That's a video that I watch like literally in my blankets, covering myself every time to see if this happened to her, if this happened to uh, to this family, surely it can happen to us as well. And at the time, because um, I didn't know your last name, I don't know how I managed to find you this time, <laughs> but I didn't know because I would have found you before and speak to you because that was me like if i see a doctor who's done a bone marrow transplant i would find that doctor i would email him and with uh, with our case our daughter had so many complications with a uh, chest and everything i just did a, a reassurance uh, somebody to reassure me over and over again that if you took this treatment she would be fine the most terrifying thing was the chemo to work on the already damaged lungs and that was a worry for everyone even the doctors you know and uh, so thank you for that. Whoever took that video and posted, you changed our lives, literally, literally. You are so welcome. I did, um, when they approached me to share my story, I said yes immediately because it's not really something that you can explain to someone. Um, it, it, it is a, a, an incredible journey. And I also um, volunteered to help um, other families at the same hospital who were gonna go through that journey. So I also have helped a few other families too with their questions or just being there through their journey as well. Um, it's, um, I am humbled. I am I am so humbled and I am so happy and thankful and grateful for you and your journey and your daughter and um, I'm so happy for you guys because it's truly um, a difficult a tough journey it's not um, you know there I used to literally you talk about the chemo the lines coming out of his chest um I literally just would go to the bathroom and just cry. And he he his his he he had the most incredible spirit. You know, he was just positive and happy and I was just like I will not let him see me cry or or be and, down. and you know what? You beat yourself because here here they are. The treatment is going so well. But it's just a fear of the unknown. Like literally, I would look myself in the mirror and slap myself like, why are you crying? She's fine. There's no complications, but it's just a fear of the unknown. I tell you one time during the treatment, she was having, um, I think a, a hot dog or something, I can't remember, and they had tomato sauce. And so I saw tomato sauce somewhere, I think near the nose or somewhere on the mouth. In my head, all I saw was she is bleeding from the brain. And wow. I ran and pressed the button and it was cold blue in the hospital. The doctor's full in the ward. What is it? I'm like, she's, she, she's bleeding. She's bleeding. She's bleeding. Can you? And then they said, the nurses looked at it. She's like, it's just it matters us. That's it. And the room was full of doctors. You know how they come, you know, the, the nurses, how you come in with the trolleys because yes, we thought yes. the worst. That's how anxious and how scared I was. We stayed in hospital the least amount of time, 29 days, plus the 10 days chemo, nine days chemo, one day resting period, and 39, 40 days we were out. But it was just the fear of the unknown. And, um, you know, I, I can't believe, actually, seriously, relieving that whole story. So this, this brings us now to your, definitely your, you, the whole journey that you went through um, from the time that now you are told that, okay, this is it, you are going through to have the bone marrow transplant. What was going through your head at that time as, as a family? What was going through your minds? Um, basically, all of our family members were praying. I reached out to as many people as I could just to kind of 
explain what is going on, um, what we are going through. Um, and just, I tried really hard to prepare as much as possible. As you said, you do spend a, an incredible amount of time in the hospital. Um, so I was with him in the hospital. It was also um, hard because I wasn't able to be with Michael. Michael was at home. You know, it was hard being away from him. Um, so basically, um, we just got everything together, uh, packed up. One of the most difficult times for me in preparation for the transplant was signing the papers um, because he was part of a special um, project. Um, and therefore, as protocol, we did have to sign papers to see if anything did go wrong. Um, you know, um, the other side is not something that everybody likes to talk about or think about but that also was a very you know it, it was a, a a hard day for me um signing those papers and reading what could possibly happen to him but um i tell you it wasn't me alone it wasn't me it it, it definitely was a, the, the the christ spirit in me because i just knew no matter what i just knew this this, this is for him this, yeah. this is what you prayed for i've mm -hmm. answered your prayer he's he's gonna be okay so let's just push forward so i just you know with everything that i had i said i'm going to just be the the best everything i could be for him um mm -hmm. so in preparation we had a whole protocol what to bring to the hospital test test done every day when he went into the hospital the first night we had a complete, he had a complete um, blood transfusion. They literally hooked him up to a machine and um, basically gave him new fresh blood, a complete blood transfusion. But before that, he had to have um, a central line placed. He literally had two tubes sticking out of his neck, which was <laughs> at first, when I saw that after the first surgery, I just was like, um, what am I? What am I doing? Am I doing the right thing here? Like, what, what is going on? This everything looks so scary. And when he got the um, central line placed, and they said, "Well, this is directly in his heart. You have to be careful um, with him jumping around and all of that stuff." Um, it was just, you know, and they do explain that if any of the what's the emergency protocol, if any of the lines do open. Um, so it was it was a lot pre preparing, but we just um, knew this was the right thing to do. Yeah. The other option of yeah. seeing him just being in pain and um, all the things that he went through in the ICU, it just you know it it wasn't worth it. Um, not trying to give this a shot. I think that there comes a time where you just surrender and say, you know, it's okay. And have those, having those positive words, positive thoughts. I had to email, actually call the doctor because um, our daughter, the donor, had to also have like a mini therapy with her own doctor. And he had okay. to give a report that, you know, I've interviewed this girl because she was uh, 12 at the time. Okay. And he, he, he just, the report, I saw the report, there was one word that I didn't like. You know, as we say, you had to sign and say anything is possible. He put it in black and white to say, I explained to this family that this word, I won't even say it, it's possible. And the family are aware. I said, my answer to him was that I'm going through with this knowing that my daughter will come out alive 100%. I know it's there, but I won't even think about it. I'm going in knowing that God is with us. And my daughter will go in alive and come back alive 100%. And then I called him. I said, no, that's, this is not what I said. You are changing that report. He thought I was joking. I said, no, you are changing. Because if I accept you to send this report to my uh, do other doctors, um, uh, other do doctors, they'll think that I, I've, I've given a confirmation. I'm actually confessing that. Um, no, right. you're changing. Yeah. And he had to change the report. Literally change it because... I just believed with uh, everything that we put in prayer that God has answered our prayer. And through some of my vivid dreams were just crazy what I saw. 
that's why we went through as well. It's really a life changing, <laughs> life changing experience that I, I don't know whether I'll ever, ever go through that again in my life, no matter anything that you go through. I don't know about you. Um, it's definitely um, not something that I would like to repeat in my lifetime. <laughs> Um, it's, it's, um, it's amazing. It's, it, it, it's wonderful. It's, 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 it's just so, like you said, life changing the decisions that you have to make. Um, one of the things that happened to him is that, um, after the transplant, everything was going fine. And then he just started to lose weight. Um, so we took him in, they had to, um, you know, he just kept, he had diarrhea. He just kept losing weight, couldn't keep anything down. So then again, it was, oh no, what's happening? And um, he did end up with Crohn's disease. Are you familiar with Crohn's disease? Yeah, I've heard, I've heard about it. Yeah. Right. So it, mm -hmm. it kind of falls into the irritable bowel syndrome kind of um, diseases. So he, he ended up having that. So then, um, he had to start getting uh, parental nutrition. And um, for a while he was on medication for Crohn's disease. And would I have you know that he has, he doesn't have Crohn's disease anymore. Wow. It's gone. Wow. It is Praise gone. Praise God for that. Wow. Mm. Yeah. So, so with the, with the, um, if, if you go through the process, like in brief, I know it's a long 29, 30 day period. If you can just remember like the first days you go in hospital, you had the first blood uh, transfusion. What next, like for, for those people that don't know what happens in the bone marrow transplant, what did you go through the second day and you know the, the days to come? Okay, so um, after we went in, he did have the full transplant. So they transfused his blood. Then they went and they placed the central line for him. And so um, after that, he started his chemotherapy regimen. So because this was a special study and protocol, the doctors that took care of him, they came every day. And they also explained that what they did, they did not use the full dose of chemotherapy because he was young and they took into consideration weight, height, all of those things. So they developed a special protocol for him. So With the reduced conditioning. With reduced conditioning, yes. is it? Yeah. Exactly, yeah. yes. So his dose of chemotherapy was different. Um, they did start the chemotherapy. There were a few other medications that he were on. He would get injections every day also. And um it was, we were in the negative pressure room, of course, um, you know, no just going in and coming out. Um, and also it wasn't just, you know, hospital stuff. They had, <laughs> it was two glass doors and he couldn't come out, but um, they would have um, entertainers like clowns and stuff come and do their little thing in front of the door for him. And um, he was able to have, we had like crayons, books, you know, different things to, to try to entertain him and make it not as monotonous for him. So we would have um, test results. They would draw blood every day. There was just like a, a protocol that we were following. And every day the doctors came in, checked on him, um, and they would kind of like give me an update. Yes, his hair did fall out um, as with chemotherapy. Um, but before that, we actually had um, went to the barber and try to take off as much as possible because we really didn't want him having an experience of, um, you know, just waking up and he's here on the pillow or anything scary like that. So we would have um, tests. He, he started receiving the chemotherapy and um, there were a lot of explanations, you know, about the different medications he was taking, what they were doing and um, how and when they would actually be ready for the transplant they would check his you know white blood cell count of course to um, make sure everything was okay um and just um, a lot of tests cbc's just just kind of 
for that period of time. And they said everything was going according to plan. And um, then we were actually um, ready for the day of transplant and the day of transplant was incredible. Michael came in the night before to the, the same hospital. He came in the night before, so they actually shared the room the night before um, the transplant. And um, in the morning, uh, I went down with Michael for him to have his transplant. And of course they had to um, take him to the OR and put him to sleep for that procedure. And then you are there when they take you and they they give the gas and oh I I don't like that uh, the the last time she had the surgery I didn't I told my sister that you go in because I literally just pass yes, out. that was really <laughs> hard for me yeah. when they would when they did put um, especially Malik when they put him to sleep um, I try I was there holding his hand and I'm just saying you know just relax but he would always, um, you know, he'd always fight when you could see that the medication was taking effect on him and he would always fight. And it was just like the worst look on his face. So I could feel like, you know, he's struggling with, he, you know, he was having a hard time. And um, that moment when you actually have to let go of their hand and walk out of that OR, yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> Words can't really describe a lot of what you go through. That's the truth. I know. I know. My, my daughter had gone through, I think, uh, I think four or five surgeries. And every time I dreaded that, I would maybe tell dad the other time. Another time was a good friend of mine. And another time was my sister. But the transplant one, for the other one, I had to go in. I had to go in. And so you experience that. And it's a very confronting thing to see as a mom but you know we gotta do it somehow and we did it so yeah and did your with daughter, the, yeah i just want did your daughter have any issues with her spleen yes so her spleen was taken out at about i can't remember i think she was five or six yeah so we had to take it out oh, yeah okay so yes one of the surgeries she's had a multiple so that that for us that was the reason why we had to undergo this she just had so many complications and nothing worked and nothing worked and in the end we decided to accept the clinical trial she was the first child to have the bone marrow transplant uh, for sickle cell ss here in in melbourne if anything in australia i think and um I, we are lucky again because the sister was a full match so that really was, um, you know, a game changer for us and for other families who've come after us. Now it's at least a few people are coming in and we are talking about this. It's only two years ago. That was the first time they did the transplant for sickle wow. cell in Australia. So we're still a long way to go, but things are getting better. Things are getting better. Um, you know, with the, with the now you've done the transplant, like on the day, how, how like anxious is the waiting period? Because all you do now is sit. And wait, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, it was truly incredible. Um, that morning, I remember just holding both of them because Michael was there also in the room before they took him. Um, just, you know, us holding hands and just saying a prayer. And, um, you know, just, just kind of me, what I did, I tried to just kind of release and just release and let go and let God, because we have so many feelings and, and emotions going through us, but at some point we have to acknowledge you, you know, we ask for this, it's happening now, and therefore we just have to let God do his thing. So um, I said a prayer that morning and um, I went off with Michael, um, just hugged and kissed Malik. And, you know, I just said, when I see you again, this is going to be so amazing, you know, and um, <laughs> it was, it was, it was like that um, and went off with him. And then the whole time, just, I was with Michael, I knew Malik was getting a transplant and I was, you know, like, I, it's almost like I couldn't breathe. Mm -hmm. Um just waiting and waiting and um when michael eventually did wake up and we went back up to the room all i saw was just smiles 
from the doctors and nurses and everybody was clapping and it, 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 it was just it was just great it was just great um he when he was having the transplant um there were there was a huge team of doctors the like you know um crash cart on standby um the whole, uh, his whole the whole team was there just in case anything um at one or two points his blood pressure did go up a little bit but um they had him hooked up to a lot of monitors also and um he 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 went through it like a champ the blood pressure for us was what that was the scary part on the first day as well they didn't they overlooked and you see they've they've done transplants before but i don't know why they thought especially the nurses like we've never done they're so anxious and felt like it was so delicate for them for whatever reasons they forgot the part of monitoring the the, the blood pressure and so on the first day i actually remember um dad was because i was the one at the hospital and they could only allow one parent to stay with him right. in the world so he would leave he would stay and maybe up to 10 11 p.m so he would leave and then all of a sudden we are going to bed and then she said oh, mom i've got a headache i was like you know and we for us pain is always numbers ever since she was old enough like tell me the number and then she's like 10 out i was like what 10 out of 10 i was like 10 out of 10 headache or immediately being a nurse i knew something was wrong yeah i called the the nurses are like please check up blood pressure check up blood pressure and they found oh my god for her almost 200 systolic it was wow. so high and we panicked that was like a true cold blue for 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 them to come in quickly and during during the day during the the transplant itself it was fluctuating up and down up and down and they would give her like you know a quick and then they also i think gave her just some some medication to move the yeah. excess fluids so i kept yeah. telling them that look this is what they did during the day i'm telling the, the night doctors and the night this is what they did now we have to call the the, the specialist because the oncologist was at home i was like you are wasting time this is what they did this is like no other it's, it's the same transplants we've done transplants when an eight day eight bad word for other kids who have transplants the medication is oh my god they panicked but in the end you know and they called her and she said oh yes do this exactly the same thing i was telling them that was the scary part that was so scary because it just changed like that and yeah, I, 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 that was the part that I, I've always tried to put aside because that was very yeah. scary for us. So I can imagine, I can imagine. Um, yeah, it's just um, the 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 team, uh, the doctors, the nurses. Um, it's 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 really something to you know. To, it, it's a life of service. It's a life of caring. It's a life of um just dedication to caring for other people and taking care of other people it's um it's really something incredible um and just like you i definitely started delving into you know nursing and just trying to understand what because we had a story uh, malik still has his spleen um but he almost had surgery to remove it he was in the ICU at, at one point and they said, look, um, he's going to come out of the ICU, step down tomorrow. We, you know, sickle cell patients um, lose the function of their spleen. So he doesn't have the function of his spleen right now. Just as a precaution, this can become a complication. Let's go ahead and um, remove it. Yeah. Um, at that point, I actually went to uh, one of my biology professors <laughs> and um, uh, I said, you know, Dr. Pacino, you know, this is what's happening. This is what they said to me. What do you think? And he said, is that, is his spleen causing a problem right now? I said, no. He said, but he's just going to step down from ICU today. He's weak. I don't think this is the best time to perform surgery. Um, so I went back to them and, you know, the doctor was looking at me like, who's the civilian? She doesn't know anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. This is why I tell parents every time that, you know, you are your first, you're, you're, you're first, like the, the own advocate in everything you do. I, I tell them that, you know, look, you don't have to do drastic things like me and go and study nursing and, oh, 
but at least try to understand what your, your child is going through. Yeah. If the doctor changes medication, if the doctor does that, you know, even if you don't have the questions there, go and research like what you did. Go and yeah. research afterwards and come back and just shoot with the questions so that the yeah. doctors are amazed. Like I was telling the doctors, like, there's no way you're going to change magnesium. They wanted to take to, to stop magnesium because one of the like like you when your, your your son had a bone marrow transplant to become like a support person for yeah. another family. So we had a support family who told me that Agnes, when you go there, make sure the magnesium they forgot to give us to give him <laughs> give my daughter magnesium. You know, we, we had a um, our support family. The daughter had uh, thalassemia, so she she was the first okay. child to to do the transplant. So I, I wrote it down. So, and unfortunately, they wanted to stop it. I'm like, why are you stopping? Look at the levels. The levels are low. You want to right. stop magnesium. You want to stop the medication for, for hypertension. So tell me your rationale. Why you exactly. should change this? And then they exactly. all convened and they're like, I think we'll come back tomorrow. I'm like, yes, that's a good idea. The following day we had a meeting. They said, okay, we'll leave this, but we'll do that. We'll do that. I said, yes. So I always tell parents, be your own advocate. Try to read as much as you can. Even if it takes you a week, come back and shoot the questions to the doctors because you can just save your, your child or your family if you know at least just a tiny bit of what, what's going on. Exactly, exactly. And, um, you know, he, he, he looked at me like, okay. And I said to him, I said, well, this is my rationale for why I'm making this decision. Yeah. And... um. He said, well, you know, um, you know, he just kind of kept repeating what he was saying. And I said, I'm not going to approve this. I really don't believe that this is necessary right now. I believe he's too weak at this time. Um, I don't think this is the best thing for him. So maybe at a later date, we could talk about this, but not right now. And do you know that that issue never came back up? And can I tell you that after the transplant, Malik's clean became fully functional. functional again oh my god oh my god that's <laughs> amazing that's amazing well for us we we were one of those who like you are you're sitting like this we just look at our lips our eyes that something is wrong here and I, I was taught how to feel the spleen would be rushing so many times we would have the spleen crisis at one point we went to ed and the doctors are debating now nah, i think it's a lung i'm like seriously you think the lung would come <laughs> i'm like this is a spleen i've been taught how to feel this they are waiting for the doctors the hematologists yeah. to tell them what was happening so in the end it had to come out it had to come out for us I'm so mindful of time. We said it was an hour and I'm loving this discussion. <laughs> but just quickly, we'll maybe five minutes of your time extra. We've got about two minutes before an hour goes. I told you it goes so quick. <laughs> I know, you're right. You're so right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, how long did you have to wait for the new cells to start coming out now? They're growing because us every morning was like, tell us, tell us, do, do we have neutrophils today? How long was it for you guys? Um, it was probably over like within 48 hours, we started to see, you know, counts were low at first, obviously, but every single day, um, they would come and report to us. Yes, it's looking better. It's looking better. It's looking better. Um, his counts are going up. Everything's looking good. Um, we think he accepted the transplant really good. And, um, you know, no complications, no complications. Um, his, you know, his, he's, he's stable and everything is looking good. And obviously it's a lot of tests. It's a lot of tests. It is a lot of, um, they drew blood every single, come draw blood every single day. But I'm telling you, every time I saw those doctors and Dr. Batia is her name, I swear she is my personal angel. Every time I saw them and she would just have like the biggest smile on her face and just incredible i am so grateful i am so thankful um to these people for the work that they do for just the dedication the time spent um it's just it it, it is amazing they've touched my life in the most incredible way um so every day 
as the counts increased, we were just so happy. They said, yes, the bone marrow transplant is in place now. And um, we continue to come to the clinic. So we would be there. And then after we left the hospital, we'd go in every two days to the clinic. Mm -hmm. Then it would be every four days and then every six days. So what we did was, um, of course, at home too, you know, after the transplant, there's a whole regimen of medication, all the medications to prevent rejection. So um, I literally- The psychosporin, the psychosporin. <laughs> if I can turn the camera on my dressing table right now, we had a regime when they told us when we are weaning down from, I can't remember, I think that was, uh, I think I can't see my, my dressing table is a bit far. Um, I say it's the A4 paper where we put down how we are winning down the psychosporin until the, the yeah. year exactly when she was weaned off. The clean food, the isolation, it was, yeah, it's life changing. Like when the COVID was coming for us, we already knew what to do with isolation. <laughs> so it was nothing new. It was yeah. nothing new. Yeah. And how, how much medication was, was he on? Like, you know, all these medications. He was on basically about 10 different medications. Um, what happened, one of the things that happened to him too is um, one morning he woke up and literally something was poking out of his stomach. So with that, I, I just pressed on it and just kind of rebunged it against my finger and we rushed him in right away. And it was actually his gallbladder because when he was younger, he was on uh, one of the medications, Actagol. And so... It was his gallbladder that literally just, it was swollen to like three times the size and literally just poking out of his stomach. So he had emergency surgery to remove his gallbladder. Um, and that was because of one of the medications that he had been on for a couple of years. So he had a list of about, at first, about 10 to 15 medications um, he used to get at home. What they did is here we have a compact pharmacy. So what they did was, all the medications he had to take by mouth, they had them, um, a chemist, they kind of made them taste sweet. So, okay. okay that was, Cause he was, he was, a, he was a baby. He was, how old was he? Four or five? Uh, yeah. He was just five, five years old. Yeah. He so was young just, cause yeah, my daughter was twice that age she was 10. So I, I bet she was young. Yeah. yeah. It, it, so they were there. They compacted and uh, put some sugar coating so that you can yes. take it like yeah, strawberry flavor and all that stuff in there. So he was able to take. So every day he'd have medication about three times during the day. And I had, I don't know, I think I had like 500 syringes in my house. Um, <laughs> and what I, and, and Ziploc bags that you can't even like boxes of Ziploc bags. So what I would do is I would drop his medications and, um, we had the, the times labeled and everything just in case I wasn't home. Um, it, you know, um, whatever family member was around, um, they'd know like at this time and him also, he got, um, used to the regimen and he would know like, well, at this time, all my medications are, and, uh, are due and they would actually also send a teacher in. So he was able to still have classes at home. Um, yeah. And so we had those medications. So at least, um, three times a day, then we went to twice a day and they just kind of continue to um, wean him off. And I'm trying to remember the name of one of his medications. Um, oh, the one that um, they kind of keep looking at and to prevent rejection. Of the transplant. I don't know the name yeah. there, but that the psychosporin was the one that he was the anti-rejection. I mean, there's different types, but for us, that's the one that oh, she was okay. taking. Yeah. They used a different one here. I'm trying to remember the name of it, but of course you had to watch those levels very, very carefully, um, you know, to, to, to make sure that everything was okay. Um, and it's, you know, what's another incredible thing? We'd um, go somewhere, go to a hospital or, you know, you know, at that point they check, they continue to check everything also. Um, they're always checking his chest, um, just, you know, different tests, EKGs, checking the heart, all of that. And um, at one point, I literally knew the name of every single medication he was on, the dosage, everything. I would just like rattle it off like, oh, yeah, da, 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 just, you know, yeah, yeah, and yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's something, it's something. 
And how long did, because uh, our daughter, as we speak next week, she's got another appointment. So how, up to what age were you, uh, or is he still being checked? How up to what age um, was he being well, monitored? We, we lived in New York. Uh, for We moved out to Virginia about, about two and a half years ago. Um, and um, since then, they haven't really requested any labs from us. But um, for at least... Um, at least five years, for at least five to six years afterwards, every single six months and then a year, he would go in and they check all systems again just to make sure everything's okay. Um, and um, he is, um, you know, per protocol, that was a special study. So anytime they need to check anything or they would just since we're out here, they could just communicate with us and let us know, well, we need this lab results or that lab results, just, um, you know, for information for their study. But um, at this point, they don't really, um, we don't have a lot of um, things to do for him. Yeah, just, you know, he gets a flu shot. And then with, with COVID, um, of course, I consulted them with the in terms of the COVID vaccine. And um, they said, yes, it, it's, it's okay for him to have the vaccine. So did you discuss any protocols for uh, fertility issues for, I don't know whether they do anything for, for boys. Do they have to reserve anything? Um, that too was a bit heart wrenching for me. They do harvest, um, you know, they do harvest um, cells for them and keep it for them. But, we chose not to um, have him go through that. It's just like another, um, you know, kind of like, it was kind of like just trusting in God at that point. Um, and I'm just like, you know, if he, you know, I, I truly believe he is meant to experience the joy of having children. And um, that's something that we kind of left in um, God's hand, but they did give us also that option. They said, well, hey, you know, um, we could just, just to make sure, um, you know, the chemotherapy does a lot of things to the body um, and um, can have a whole lot of long-term effects also. So that that also was an option they had they, they had discussed with us. Okay, I'm glad they did. They gave us that option as well here. So the, the protocol is, is pretty much the same. Everything is very, very similar from yeah. having the yeah. reduced conditioning to, you know, these different medications. These kids just go through so much. Has he ever, yes. um, does he remember anything? Because my daughter has refused to tell us. She was old enough. She can't tell us. She's refused. She doesn't want to talk about it. Yeah, he's never really wanted to talk much about it either. But one of the, I was always curious as to, in terms of his pain, um, he's gotten to the point where he literally just said, mom, I can't take this anymore. I just want to die. I can't take this pain anymore. So after everything, I said to him, I said, is it possible for you to describe the pain that you were feeling? He said, mom, the best analogy I can give you is somebody literally taking a baseball bat and they're just hitting me on my knee. Just keep hitting me, hitting me, hitting me continuously with no break. So, I mean, I just like, it just made my heart sink because it just, it, that, it, it's just incredible the amount of pain that he used to be in. And uh, they used to give him morphine a lot. Yeah. And um, we- That's Very discovered, strong medication. Yeah. yeah um, I didn't like that. Um, and um, we actually discovered that Tylenol Motrin, extra strength Motrin, I am, for some reason, works really good with our family because I get migraines and that helps me. So- um, after we actually used to use the tile, the um, Motrin as a part of his pain regimen that actually used to help a whole lot. Yeah. But he doesn't, he still says, oh, I don't remember a whole lot of stuff, um, you know, but um, I took a lot of pictures and videos. I don't really bombard him with that kind of stuff, but. Um, one day, you you will appreciate that. We've also got videos yeah. and pictures. One day we'll. I've got the congratulations yeah. to you um with the book um what you are doing is incredible i know you are going to touch so so many more lives and i think that it is really important what you're doing um it is really 
something, you know, we get motivated by a lot of the experiences we have in life. And um, congratulations, what you're doing is incredible. Um, it's you, you, you can't imagine the same way I couldn't imagine the lives that my story would touch. Um, you can't imagine the lives that all of this that you're doing is, it, it, the, the, you know, the incredible results from this. So, you know, God bless you and your family. And thank you. Oh, thank you. No, thank you so much. It just means so much. I, I think the experience taught me something for me to think big and it, it sort of now it's out of my hands that this is got nothing. It's, it's nothing, not about me anymore. And anything that I do, like from every experience for, for writing that book was something, everything that I do is something that I experience. I remember when I told my daughter, she was like, what, what is sickle cell? I don't even know what it is. And then she realized that she was different and the question started coming. Why me out of all the four kids, you know? So yeah. everything that I do, I've realized um, someone somewhere might be experiencing the similar things that we went through as a family. And it, it means a lot. Thank you so much. But <laughs> You're welcome. You, you, you really touched our lives as well. And um, I go back to that video and, you know, <laughs> I, I think everyone in our family saw it like, you know, this is this a video. See, this family went through. Because <laughs> even my daughter is a doctor. Like, you know, this family they went through, are you sure it's going to be like this? Because it was the first one the first one at this yeah. hospital the first one in australia we were all just anxious we didn't know what to expect so thank you tell malik you and the whole family you <laughs> helped us go through the worst period of our lives so thank you so much and um i'll wait for those pictures i'm looking at time it's almost quarter yeah, past I I know. Know. we can talk all day i promise we can talk all day because i want you to come back and share something good again and i don't want you to say that oh she's going to keep me over an hour but before you go let's just see because uh, usually what i do i'll, I'll share the video around because i'm just so engrossed in this i didn't have time to reshare it yeah. it's just on one page but let's just see if we have um and i'll just mute myself in Okay, so we do have a few comments on Facebook, and I'll just uh, share a screen and see whether we can do that. Um, yeah, I think the best thing to do is to share a screen. Where is it? I think this one. We can share them together. We can read them together. So we have um, We have BC and we have Jacqueline and um, oh, welcome, welcome. Yeah, so the, if one has a sibling who is a full match, uh, do they do the transplant even if the child does not have a severe sickle cell complication? What what's your what's your take on that? What would be your answer? If I put my opinion as well. Um, right. Um. I I believe that um that's something that would have to be discussed. I think that just the potential complications um, of things that could happen is um, would be enough for me to say, yes, I would go ahead and um, just, um, I would go ahead and do the transplant, um, especially when it comes to um, quality of life. And um, yeah, I definitely would say yes, because there are a whole host of things that, could happen. Um, some people at first, they don't get a lot of crises or certain things may not happen to them, but you, the future is unpredictable. And if I, if we have a way of preventing them from actually going through certain things, I definitely would say yes, go for it. Yeah, I would say the same because it's just so unpredictable. And uh, with sickle cell disease, as we know, it, it slowly, slowly affects the organs of uh, your body. So especially if they are younger, I would, if possible, if you are given that option, you would go for it. But again, this has to be decided as a team by your yeah. doctor. Um, they are the best people to advise you what to do. But if I was a parent and uh, seeing what we went through, if I'd known um, so much, because for us, we waited for 10 years for other reasons. Um, yeah, but the best options, again, the doctors and um, 
if they explain because your body slowly the organs are being affected yes so. and it's it's a lot of damage at the capillary and and you know the, the small vessels there's a lot of damage um there so Jacqueline says uh, um glad for for you are for us but in in her time I think she says they did not have that that treatment for for the years her body was and uh, is dealing with it so yeah unfortunately for especially in this country I I I I know it wasn't something that was offered for for people cuz as i've said it only started here in australia for sickle cell disease ss about 2 years yes. ago yeah but even in america you know was was the the first person in the 80s 1982 or 85 i think the yes i I, I believe i believe it probably was around 82 and also before they even um started doing transplant for children they were doing transplants for adults they're actually doing transplants for adults here so yeah they are doing transplants for adults but again again it's a team effort your doctors your different team to decide and just see how you can go but belinda thank you so much again thank you oh please thank do keep us. in touch your story your journey is incredible it has touched me also and i am so appreciative for this time and this opportunity so thank you so much mm -hmm.